Coming up, unfortunately, rock and roll and tragedy go hand in hand. I mean, it was only a matter of time, but today's feature band was going down in flames. I mean, one of their album covers even predicted it. And so did one of their songs, for that matter. An early prophetic rocker that warned them there would be hell to pay. Honestly, no one worked harder than this band. But the problem was no one parted harder either. And it was nearly to the point of self-destruction. I mean, their trail of carnage included knockdown, down drag-out brawls, punched-out teeth, furniture flying out fifth-story windows, uh, the lead singer cutting the guitarist's hand the night before a gig. One time, the lead singer tried to throw someone out of a plane mid-flight. I mean, come on, that's pretty insane. Blacklisted from hotels and airlines alike, it all came to a tragic conclusion on October 20th, 1977. After this day, the band would never be the same again. Brace yourself. This one's as crazy as rock and roll gets. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time, especially today. You know, if you remember playing Frogger on your Atari, you're going to dig the channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the big red button so you always know when our interviews and our latest videos come out. Uh, you can also check us out on Patreon. You can become an honorary producer to help us curate this music history. It's so important as we're losing legends all the time. So today, we're bringing you a Leonard Skinner double feature from their 1977 album, Street Survivors. Street Survivors is an unintentionally tragic album, closing out the 70s iteration of this band. Two songs we're going to cover, What's Your Name and That Smell. What's your name? So back in 76, Time Magazine ran an article about Leonard Skinner called The Rot Gut Life. The title was taken from a quote from uh, frontman Ronnie Van Zandt and fully encapsulated uh, the alcohol-soaked, knock him down, drag him out, beat him up lifestyle Leonard Skinner lived day in and day out. Said the article, and I quote, no American rock group works harder or equals the decibel level of Leonard Skinner, a band of seven Southerners who seldom see their homes outside of Jacksonville. Going into their fifth studio album, Street Survivors, those seven Southerners included lead singer Ronnie Van Zant, guitarist Gary Rosington, Alan Collins, and Steve Gaines, bassist Leon Wilson, drummer Artemis Pyle, and keyboardist Billy Powell. But even with some new faces at this point in the band's career, they were no less rowdy. Truth is that while no other rockers worked harder than these guys, Leonard Skinner outpartied everybody as well. Uh, Skinner's fiery temperament was no stage act, though. By 1976, the band had racked up more than a dozen arrests on charges spanning from possession of illegal substances to assault. I mean, in 1975 alone, Ronnie Van Zant was arrested five times for alcohol-related offenses. Now, that Time Magazine piece I mentioned, it chronicled several of Skinner's less-than-legal exploits, including one episode when the guys destroyed half the exercise machines at a Nashville hotel. And another when uh, Ronnie Van Zant threw an oak table out of fifth floor window in a British inn. <laughs> I mean, damages to hotel rooms and property would cost the band a fortune. Reparations were routinely made by the band's road manager who paid an average of $1,000 a month to hotels for the band's destructive ways. And honestly, that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you consider inflation, that's about $6,000 today, which means that Leonard Skinner was paying more than $70,000 a year in just hotel damages. That's not including the wreckage that they got away with. But as you can imagine, the band's reputation soon began to precede them, and hotels in many cities refused to accommodate them. I think them and uh, this band and Joe Walsh uh, had some trouble getting into hotels. That reputation even extended to the friendly skies. Um, Skinner got in trouble with airlines so often, they started getting blacklisted from commercial flights. A producer, Tom Dowd, who flew with them, he couldn't believe how out of control this band would get. I mean, their rowdy behavior often triggered the wrath of the flight crews who threatened to have the band arrested when they landed. I mean, one time, Ronnie Van Zandt even tried to throw a road member, uh, a crew member, uh, a guy named John Butler, out of the plane in flight. Uh, I guess it was somewhere over Europe. I mean, I'm not sure how close he got. That's pretty messed up, though. But the guys never made a big deal out of it, actually. Uh, Ronnie Van Zandt himself characterized all these exploits as just 
having a little fun and you know letting off some of the pressures of touring, blowing off some steam. Said Van Zant, and I quote, after a while you turn dingy, your mind and your body won't take it. All of it, of course, was fueled by excessive amounts of alcohol, one of the band's routine coping mechanisms. You know, a little scotch, a little whiskey, a little champagne, uh, when the occasion called for it, which was a lot. Said Ronnie, this is a rock gut life, but why worry? Hotels and airlines weren't the only casualties, though. The band members themselves were also beating the hell out of each other. In the case of Billy Powell getting his teeth knocked out, uh, perhaps the most infamous example is a drunken brawl in a German hotel room, dubbed the Bloodbath in Hamburg. So Leonard Skinner had arrived in the German city on October 14, 1975. The following night, they were set to begin their European tour. And everything was going just fine until they hit the hotel bar. Recounting what prompted the incident, Gary Rosington said, and I quote, the only thing we thought about was the music, or somebody got too drunk, usually Ronnie. We drank beer and whiskey every single night, scotch or Jack Daniels and sometimes champagne. But the guy at the hotel bar, he gave us cold peppermint schnapps. We'd never seen that. We'd never even heard of schnapps. They had the glass all frozen. It tasted so good. So we were just knocking them back. So fully inebriated, the band returned to their hotel rooms. Probably not a good idea. They were supposedly arguing uh, about how to pronounce schnapps. And from there, Ronnie's temper started just to bubble over. According to Gary Rosington, Van Zant once again picked a fight with John Butler, the guy I mentioned before that he almost threw out of the plane. While the band was trying to separate the two, Ronnie smashed a bottle over John Butler's head. It immediately shattered all over. Then continuing in his drunken rage, the front man turned on Rosington shouting, I'm going to cut your hands. You're never going to play guitar again. And he did it. <laughs> Can you believe it? Gary's hands and wrists were spewing blood. But before the fight could escalate any further, the drummer Artemis Pyle jumped into the fray and he started throwing Ronnie around. And finally, you know, he was able to restrain him on the bed so Rosington could pull out of the room with his bloody hand. Accompanied by Alan Collins, the two musicians searched for the nearest emergency room. Neither of the men spoke a lick of German, but they did find one and they were able to more or less explain to the doctors what had happened. Rosington, for his part, received 10 stitches in one hand and 11 in the other. And then Ronnie, for his part, broke his hand and received a <laughs> bruised windpipe. When Gary returned to the hotel, Ronnie wasn't exactly remorseful. No apologies at all. Instead, he told Gary to catch the first flight home. But Rosington, he said, nah, I think I'll stick around. And I guess that was the end of it. That is until the next night when Gary played the show with his hands bandaged and just two fingers on the frets. To the band, the performance felt like a big flop, but the fans and the critics, they loved it. Yeah, Skinner was that good. They actually killed it. One reviewer said, if that's what they think is bad, it's in reality quite good. I think I'd like to see him on a good night. Barring any more rounds of schnapps, of course. And beneath a magazine photo of the band, a caption read, when a band starts slashing each other's wrists before gigs, you know they're confident. So leading up to their final Ronnie Van Zandt album, stories like these continued to pile up from all over. It really seemed like Skinner was on a crash course, headed to their own destruction, unfortunately. So the fact that they were all still alive made the name of their fifth studio album, Street Survivors, uh, a somewhat appropriate title. Street Survivors was recorded in three locations in 1977. There's Criteria Studios in Miami, uh, there was uh, Studio One in Doraville, Georgia, and Muscle Shoals Sound Studios in Muscle Shoals, Alabama. The album was released on October 17, 1977, and peaked at number five on the Billboard 200. Three singles were issued. You got that right, What's Your Name, and That Smell. Comes to a fix, not a way to fight. You got that right, What's Your Name? The last two are part of today's double feature. Uh, really, some great stories behind these two classics. As we get into them, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I always wear on here. Right now, at Zenny, you can get just about any type of frame or lens that you have need for at a fraction of the cost of their competitors. Make sure you go design your own look by clicking on our info button right up here. You're going to love it. Ooh, 
So perhaps Ronnie Van Zant's most obvious attempt at a three minute hit, What's Your Name is based on a true story. Um, yes, it originated with yet another drunken brawl while out on tour. Apparently while the boys of Skinner were slamming them back at their hotel bar, one of the roadies got into a fight. And as a result, they were all kicked out of the bar. Uh, not wanting the party to end, the group gathered in one of their rooms and kept the alcohol flowing by ordering some champagne. On Ronnie's arm and along for the ride, the front man had himself a little queen, as he says. Uh, well, the police said, we can't drink in the bar, what a shame. Won't you come upstairs, girl, and have a drink of champagne? Come upstairs, girl, and have a drink of champagne. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? What happens next is pretty much, you know, what the song's about. What's Your Name is about an all too familiar scenario that happens when you're a band on the road a lot of times. Married man plus alcohol plus a pretty girl kind of equals, you know, you can finish the equation. Ronnie Van Zant, who had been married to his wife Judy Seymour since 1972, was sadly writing from experience on this song. According to Gary Rosington, both he and Ronnie wrote What's Your Name one night when they were in Miami with Steve Cropper and producer Tom Dowd. And although the song name checks Boise, Idaho in the opening line, the incident didn't actually take place uh, in the Potato State. Reportedly, the first line was originally it's eight o'clock and boys, it's time to go. However, Ronnie changed it when he heard that his brother Donnie was uh, opening his first national tour with his band 38 special in Boise. So he reworked the first line to do, it's eight o'clock in Boise, Idaho. Uh, being an Idaho boy, I can certainly appreciate the reference. Eight o'clock in Boise, Idaho. What's Your Name was released as the lead single from Street Survivors. It reached number 13 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number seven on the U.S. Cashbox chart. Did one better in Canada, going to number six. Since then, it's had a lot of media placements, shipping news, uh, Hawaii Five-O, Young Sheldon, to name a few. It's also been covered by Sister Hazel and Kim Carnes. So the second half of our Street Survivor double feature is the single, That Smell. That was co-written by Ronnie Van Zant and Alan Collins. There've been a lot of urban legends about this one, including uh, a story that it was about a roadie who had a problem with flatulence and always smelled. But actually in reality, the smell in that smell is a reference to the stench of death. You know, the song was basically calling out the band's living on the edge behavior, warning that if they didn't get things under control soon, there would be hell to pay. Too much smoke. Look what's going on inside you. Now, Ronnie, he'd been wanting to get some things off his chest, in particular what he thought about Gary Rosington's very avoidable brushes with death. Uh, the song was inspired in part by a near-fatal catastrophe over Labor Day weekend in 1976. This is when Gary crashed his Ford Torino into an oak tree in Jacksonville. Uh, booze and cocaine were unfortunately both in play at that time. The wreck nearly killed him. Hence the song's jarring true to life opening lines, whiskey bottles and brand new cars, oak tree, you're in my way. And brand new cars, oak tree, you're in my way. Said Ronnie about it. I wrote that song when Gary had his car accident. It was his last year and Alan and Billy also were in car accidents all in the space of six months. So I had this creepy feeling that things were going against us, so I thought I'd write a morbid song. With the sad benefit of hindsight, that smell proved to be acutely prophetic for the band, meaning that death was stalking them all. The lyrics warn that tomorrow might not be here for you, and that the smell of death surrounds you. The smell of death surrounds you. In the end, it's a pretty creepy song. It's almost like an omen, a really sad omen. The idea of that smell's impending doom was then fleshed out on Street Survivor's album cover, actually. Tragically turned out to be more literal than metaphorical. Skinner had explained to designer George Osaki that they wanted to appear as if they were the lone group of survivors of some, you know, apocalyptic doom. Osaki hired photographer David Alexander, who posed the band uh, on the back lot of an MCA Universal Studios space. All around them, Alexander detonated flames from gasoline-filled troughs. The idea was supposed to capture Leonard Skinner coming into town and setting it ablaze. However, it straight up looked like the band was being consumed by flames. Oh man, very strange coincidence. 
Unfortunately, that smell, it was a commercial disappointment, failing to chart on the Billboard Hot 100 at all. But there were reasons for that. I'll get into that in a minute. But even so, that smell has had a fair bit of success in the pop culture arena, appearing in movies and TV shows like Miami Vice, Joe Dirt, Wild Hogs, True Blood, and Entourage, to name a few. It's also been covered by Three Doors Down and the African Wigs. So if you know anything about Leonard Skinner, you know what's coming next. Three days after the release of Street Survivors on October 20th, 1977, the band and their entourage took a fateful flight from Greenville, South Carolina to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Tragically, they never got there. The plane went down near uh, Mississippi. Should have never happened. It was actually completely avoidable as I've talked about in other episodes. This perversely legendary crash has been covered backwards and forwards by so many people. Um, you know, like I said, even on this channel, uh, we've gotten into it on our pieces on Sweet Home Alabama and, and uh, Freebird. So I'm not gonna go into great detail here. However, I do wanna pay homage to the fallen, the great Ronnie Van Zant, Steve Gaines, his sister Cassie, personal manager Dean Kilpatrick, and the two pilots who were all killed, Walter McCreary and John Gray. Ah, uh, thankfully, the majority of the passengers actually survived, though there were a lot of serious injuries and a lifetime of trauma. Uh, it was a horrific moment that changed the band forever. A band that despite its self-destructive tendencies actually continued to rise. The aftermath obviously didn't get any easier with their lineup devastated, the band dispersed, and the remaining members with the exception of Artemis Pyle joined the Rosington Collins Band. As for Leonard Skinner's remaining commercial prospects, all of a sudden that smell seemed to be in really bad taste. Its lyrics and its message were far too on the nose. So What's Your Name was hurriedly released in November of 77 as a more upbeat alternative. And out of deference to the Gaines and Van Zant families, MCA had uh, George Osaki redesign the album's end of day's cover. They removed the flames that appeared to be consuming the band. Now, hundreds of thousands of these flame albums were then recalled in the US. A decade later, in 1987, the name Leonard Skinner was revived for a reunion tour featuring Rosington Powell, Pyle, Wilkinson, and King, with Ronnie's brother Johnny Van Zant on vocals and the addition of guitarist Randall Hall. Maybe it's oversimplifying things a little, but from here the band took on a second life, though there were still some tragic days and disheartening twists to come. That's a story for another day though. But to the bitter end, I gotta say, to Ronnie Van Zandt and Leonard Skinner, the kings of Southern rock, we salute you. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Leonard Skinner and Street Survivors and these songs. What are your memories of the album, the songs, and this band? Tragic but crazy rock and roll stories. One of the many of Leonard Skinner. Man, these guys were amazing. Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe. We would love to have you as part of our community here. Until next time, three chords.